and welcome to the afternoon sessions of day two of CBD Live Europe. I'm Roisin Delaney, the editor of the Cannabis Magazine, an essential guide to CBD and medical cannabis in the UK and Ireland, and your host for this event. So thank you very much to everyone who is joining us live and to those of you who are watching this on demand at a later time. Thank you for doing so. Um, today's conference is all about advancing the case for medical cannabis in the UK, Europe and beyond. Um, because none of us are going to achieve, you know, the, the aims and objectives that we want to as a community without helping each other and without furthering the knowledge right across the continent of Europe. So I'm very pleased to say we have two experienced doctors joining us now, Dr. Daniel Couch and Dr. Mikhail Sodergren. Um, a little bit about both of our panellists before we get into the questions. Dr. Daniel Couch is a specialist registrar at general, in general surgery with 12 years of clinical experience and a PhD in cannabinoid medicinal pharmacology. He has a special interest in cannabinoid medicine, clinical research and policy development, and is medical lead at the Centre for Medicinal Cannabis. Dr. McHale is Managing Director and Academic Lead at Sapphire Medical Clinics in London, the first medical cannabis clinic to be approved by the Care Quality Commission in the UK. Dr. McHale's clinical and research interests led him to establish Sapphire Clinics at the end of 2019. And he's also a senior clinical lecturer and consultant at Imperial College London. So thank you both for giving up your time this afternoon. I know you're both very busy um, and it's certainly a very, very kind of busy time for everyone as we emerge out of these lockdown restrictions and get back into our daily lives. So I appreciate you giving up your time. If I could maybe direct the first question to, to, to Dr. Couch, if that's okay. How many patients, uh, you know, are we seeing using medical cannabis um, these days? Well, so in, thank you for the introduction um, and the opportunity to speak. Um, in terms of, so how many patients are using medical cannabis in the UK? So it's a very difficult question to answer. We can split the answer into two sections. There are those who are obtaining a prescription for um, a, a medical cannabis uh, medicine and patients using creational streets in order to relieve their symptoms um, and we know that from uh, the existing uh, national data that we're probably in the region of about a thousand or so or a couple of thousand patients in the UK to date who have accessed uh, a medical cannabis prescription through a specialist and perhaps Mikhail can give a bit more sort of information on, on that from your experience at Sapphire but certainly we know that from a study that we did at the CMC last year, that there's probably in the order of about 1.5 million patients in the UK who are using recreational cannabis to relieve a symptom of a recognized medical condition that's been uh, written down by the GP. So they're not obtaining a, a prescription per se um, to treat their symptoms, but they're obtaining from a recreational street source, if you like, or growing their own in order to really relieve their symptoms. Um, and that number was much larger than we thought it would be. Uh, we haven't we haven't re revisited that data in the last in the last year. Um, but certainly, I think Michael could probably give us a bit more information because M Michael runs a, a, a medical cannabis the Sapphire Clinic. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. Do you, do you want to come in there and, and tell us a little bit about what you are seeing in terms of patient numbers and and why they might be you know quite low in the grand scheme of things? Yeah. Uh, absolutely. So, um, first of all, thanks uh, for the invitation to speak on this panel. It's great to be joined by Dan to talk about um, really what's going on in medical cannabis in the UK. Um, and so, in regards to the patient numbers, it's interesting because um, you'll hear um, uh, you'll hear different estimates of number of uh, patients currently acting. Uh, medical cannabis in the UK market. And the only thing that's uh, 100% sure about those is that they're estimates because we don't have reliable data. There are no nationally held reliable data sets. Um, there are some data that are um, um, created out of the prescription for unlicensed medicines. Mm -hmm. And so you can make some inferences looking at those. However, those data sets are very poor. There's, there's uh, the recording is, um, we know not very accurate. Um, and for instance, CBD is not included in those. So, so it, it, it's extremely difficult to draw any inferences. Um, 
what I can say is that um, at Sapphire clinics, we've seen you know a couple of thousand patients. Um, but what we're seeing more in the last couple of months is a real, real um, growth spurt. There's a there's a significant number of patients inquiring about uh, medical cannabis. And I think what we're seeing is in many ways mirroring uh, exactly what, uh, what Australia and, and Germany and to some extent went through during this phase after the, they legalized medical cannabis. We're on that steep uh, part of the growth curve. Um, but the exact number, um, uh, nobody knows. Uh, what I'll tell you is that it's in the thousands rather than Tens and thousands of hun or hundreds of thousands, uh, but uh, but there is no um, good granularity um, in the data that's available now. Um, the second question that you asked was why is this number so low? Um, I think that the the first thing to say is that I'm not entirely sure that it is um, that low. Um, if you plot the uh, the number of patients that we can, you know, estimate based on these poor data sources to be uh, to be in the UK market. Then, um, if you normalise for the UK population, uh, we're actually tracking almost identical to Australia's curve uh, after they legalised. So, um, the numbers seem small, uh, but uh, they are completely in keeping with other countries that have legalised medical cannabis now. The UK is going to have some, or has chosen to go down a very different path to say North America, whereby we've said that for patients who are to access medical cannabis, um, what needs to happen is that you need to be seen by a specialist and that specialist needs to understand the condition that uh, you are seeking treatment for um, to an extent that he's able to confidently evaluate that you've exhausted the um, conventional treatment lines that have um, you know, robust, more robust evidence are available in the NHS, et cetera. And you're at a point where medical cannabis is appropriate for you in the context of the best available evidence for your medicine. Now, that kind of structure around how patients access medical cannabis is different from other countries. Uh, particularly in the North Americas. Um, and so that may be one of the reasons why initially now um, the, the growth has been um, lower than some may have expected. Um, I have to say that I, I don't think I expected there to be any, any higher numbers at this point than there are now. And I think that it's, it's really, really important that we are seen to be doing this the right way uh, and you know what I mean by that is that we need to, if we're going to really take medical cannabis down the route of understanding for which patients uh, this medicine is going to work best, we need we need to we need to treat it like a medicine, uh, like any other medicines. Uh, and and by illustrating that we do that, then we can you know bring on board get the support from the rest of the medical establishment, which is really one of the key aspects to being, being able to grow this patient number more. There are other, there are other reasons that are slightly more fundamental why, the, why patient numbers have, been, have, have maybe not been as high as some have expected. And, and they may be also related to general lack of awareness. Uh, you know, I, I am, I'm aware that uh, you know there are stats out there that that still illustrate that are, there are no medical cannabis is legal yet, and, and so there's awareness among patients and the public, and then there's awareness among clinicians. You know, clinicians, it's not part of their continuous professional development training unless you choose to make it so uh, that you update your understanding of where medical cannabis fits. Uh, into the current treatment pathways for certain conditions. So many doctors might not be aware that medical cannabis is available on the NHS for a number of conditions uh, these days. They may not be aware on the evidence base around chronic pain, for instance. Yeah. Um, 
and then they just the final thing is obviously financial that the you know that's one thing that you know cost to patients it's a, it's on on the whole it's in the private market now uh, it's going to probably stay there for the majority of indications for quite some time maybe up to a decade until we get licensed medicines um, and so there is a financial implication for treatment with medical cannabis unfortunately for the majority of patients in the UK and that automatically means that um, a, a proportion of the population are unable to ex access treatment because of financial constraints and I think and that I sorry go ahead go ahead well, so all of says, I completely agree with you, Michael, in that, you know, at the end of the day, we're all here to get medicines, the right, the patients, the right medicines to improve. Obviously, how it fits into that. We are here to, you know, assess what's, what's best for the patients. And I completely agree. I think um, medical cannabis is a novel medicine and is being treated as such as appropriate. And I think that there was a lot of, um, I think when the law changed in 2018, there's a lot of excitement that we would follow the same kind of third pathway that was seen in North America. Um, but that probably is not appropriate for the UK. We've got very good institutional history of drug assessment. Uh, it's very thorough and it's, and, um, and the emphasis is on, on reducing harm. And I know that's caused frustration for, for patients. Um, and people who, who believe they'll get benefit from, from medical cannabis. But I think that I completely agree. Medicine is being, uh, cannabis is being assessed as a, a novel medicine as any other pharmacological product. And I think that's entirely appropriate. And it, it, it brings us on to our next question about, you know, the time that it takes, I suppose, to get the research, to get the data, to, to you know, go through the various different phases of clinical trials, randomized control trials, to, to actually get the, the human data, the effect that this medicine can have on, on, like, you know, the general kind of areas such as pain and epilepsies and other kind of, uh, I suppose, areas that it's actually being shown that it's very effective in it in some cases. Um, so given that consensus, you know, that there is a lack of kind of clinical data right now that might take the next few years up to a decade to actually, you know, really, really tap into. Um, I suppose, how is this, you know, deficit being addressed and, and what are we doing now that's going to kind of help, you know, the case for medical cannabis in the years to come? Yeah, so uh, should I start off, Michael, then? you could be well, well, well versed to, 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 to talk about um, uh, real world data but and so the drug assessment has been run by ultra biased and um, if they're conducted appropriately the information gained from is very valuable as to whether there is benefit and also crucially whether there is harm um, and I think you know most of us would say that cannabis based medical products are very low risk um, people have been using them for a long time but nevertheless I think randomized controlled trials generate that data a very very high quality data which is very difficult to well, once you have a trial that's well conducted which supports the use of your product for a specific specific condition and in a specific population it's very hard to argue with that um and that's why nice for example um ultimately have been seeking randomized controlled trials uh, which have led to the existing nice guidance which we're very happy to see um so what's happening to, to address this there's not many randomized controlled trials there are some that have been done but they've been small or they have not you know proven to be positive um randomized controlled randomized control trials are going on um and there are now you know increasing number of academics in the uk and, and abroad and just as valuable which are uh, conducting the uh, appropriately sized and unbiased research um, but these things do, they do take time. I mean, randomized controlled trials take, you know, I've done a couple, take years and years to do, um, to, to get funded, to, to recruit to, to report on. And so these things take time. There certainly is um, a, a push from a, a kind of a national research point of view. So the National Institute of Health Research released calls for research and there is funding available to do these randomized controlled trials in the right setting. And so these things are happening. But in the meantime, uh, we're left with, Uh, the, the, the collection of data, which is essentially real world data. There's been lots of discussion about the value of real world data and, and how it can inform clinical decisions and guidance. And I guess, Michael, you're, uh, you're much better of us since you're actively collecting real world data through Sapphire to, to talk about how that filled the gaps. Yeah, um, well, so I think that it's important to, it's important to mention that the starting point of where we are now is 
a completely unique situation uh, uh, for uh, the medical profession in the UK, whereby we have a medicine that we're going to potentially, not potentially, that is going to be prescribed to large volumes of patients that has not gone down the usual drug development route prior to reaching uh, uh, reaching the doctor. So, you know, this is this is this is the only situation like this I can think of in UK history. Um, normally, when we get a new medicine as doctors, it comes after it's gone through, you know, preclinical development, optimization, phase one, phase two, phase three trials. Sometimes even um, um, after phase three trials, it, it won't end up on the NHS. There'll be further trials, there'll be further research. So we're used to getting medicines when they're at a certain stage and they'll, they'll be in the British national formulary. We can look them up. We can look up the recommended dose. We can look up the side effects. We can look at the drug indications. That's how as doctors we feel, that's what we're used to. And there's, there's, we feel sort of safety around that. And so um, that the medical cannabis is completely unique in that um, we're, we're not at that stage. For the most number of indications that patients are going to seek uh, treatment for, chronic pains, neurology, et cetera, we have not got licensed medicines yet. Um, and so that's where we are now, uh, which is which I think is under, it's important to understand why it's such a unique situation. Where we need to get, uh, in my mind, there's no doubt that we need to get to a stage where we have licensed medications with proven benefits um, that's available on the NHS for individual conditions. That is going to require um, for us to work with the current framework of assessing medicine. Um, and so uh, the way that's done is um, pretty, uh, pretty transparent. We understand it. Um, there may be some adaptations for the way we look at medical cannabis, but um, for those who say that medical cannabis shouldn't be evaluated through randomized controlled trials, that's just, that's just not right. I mean, we, we're able to apply the highest rigor of trial design to these medicines. There's no doubt that we can. So we should, uh, you know, th there's just no, no question about that. And, and if you were to say to the medical profession that cannabis should be, um, you know, in some way uh, dealt with differently, uh, you're going to be met with uh, uh, not a very positive response. And so the reason I'm saying this is that the, the end game of this is, is working within the framework that we have, and that involves randomized controlled trials. Now, uh, what are we doing to be able to address this uh, data gap that we have? You know, medical cannabis was legalized largely uh, through a very successful uh, campaign. Um, um, it wasn't legalized through a consultation with the, uh, you know, the medical profession. And so the reason I say that is that the medical profession was caught slightly off guard. There wasn't the preparatory work done in terms of education for the medical profession. And also uh, we hadn't had time to, um, to do all these trials that, that, is, that, that, are, uh, that are necessary. So now we have to catch up. Um, and there is also no doubt in my mind that whilst we're in this period where we're catching up, because we understand the safety parameters about around this medicine, we should be able to gather this data while still allowing patients who may benefit from the medicines access to them. And so there are, there are really two, two things related to this. One is really supporting randomized controlled trials and traditional research, or be that basic science research that leads to better optimized medicines through to just you know clinical trials themselves. And I think that alluded to, they've had some calls recently where they've said that we, we, we've got money, we want to fund these trials with cannabis-based medicines. Um, and, and, and that's great, we should support that. Uh, and, uh, and I wholeheartedly support that. And if there's any trial that we could, you know, through the, through Sapphire or uh, my work at Imperial where we can help in recruitment or any other way, I'm always happy to do that. But the, but the other thing which is also unique in cannabis uh, is that now that we are 
prescribing these medicines as unlicensed medicines to patients on a case by case basis, we need to record the data in a meaningful way. And that's where this real world evidence comes into play. And so, um, you know, the FDA across the pond have recently set up a whole department looking at real world evidence and how that can interact with the drug development process. I know that MHRI here are looking at similar things. We've had conversations with them about how these kind of data can uh, be integrated into the drug development process. And so come back to the very beginning of the question, which was, which was real world evidence data and, and, and what we're doing about it. Well, so at my, with my work at Sapphire, uh, we set up um, a, a really robust observational prospective cohort database called the UK Medical Cannabis Registry, ambitiously so hoping that we would capture, you know, the large proportion of patients uh, that are prescribed these unlicensed medicine as, as, um, as this evolves in the UK. And what we're able to do is we're able to get a really good insight into things like adverse events profiles, um, into how treatment changes um, longitudinally, uh, you know, if patients uh, get tolerance. Really important questions that are well answered by these kind of data sets. You know, um, we know that for if we want to compare a medical cannabis drug with this painkiller uh, for a particular condition, then the best way to do that is a randomized controlled trial. Nobody is, nobody's saying that there's any better way to do that. But this real world, real world evidence that we have now can, can give us some really, really important insights into how we roll out these medicines related to safety, what happens across longitudinal prescribing, et cetera, et cetera. And they, and almost most importantly, they are the best way for us to refine the drug development process. And what I mean by that is that um, through this data, we can understand exactly what it is that is improved in patients when we give them these medicines. So I'll give you an example, in, addition, in a normal drug trial uh, for pain, you may want to look at a score between zero to 10. Um, now, patients may say my score has gone from eight to six, but I feel, you know, and we've heard this a lot in the clinic, I feel a lot more better, I feel a lot better, my, my quality of life has changed. And actually, when you drill down into the data, it's that their sleep quality is improved, their functional things like being able to wash their hair, etc. And if we can tease out these things from the data, then we're able to use this to inform clinical trials, to use these as endpoints, so that when we do these clinical trials, not only can we make the medicines better, but they have a higher chance of having a positive outcome once we get to that stage. And that's what's unique about medical cannabis at the moment. I think it's fascinating because a, a lot of what you are saying is exactly of the same hymn sheet uh, as, as a lot of other people in the industry who are, you know, still within the, the, the life sciences kind of development field of, of medicinal cannabis products and looking at what they're working on that will be, you know, fundamental to, to kind of furthering access for patients and furthering the education of specialists and doctors to, to just further the, the case for medical cannabis in itself. But I 100% agree that we need we need that real world evidence, which you're currently working on, which is great to hear. Um, so I guess my next, my next question is, could a centrally agreed clinical pathway follow the same governance, um, or sorry, kind of help patients get the the correct medicines faster what would that look like what would a centrally clinical um a, a clinical pathway look like if, if it was centralized well i think Rishi, i'm just going to come back to a point you just made actually about the education of especially in the normal conversation yes, because i have i have quite strong views um you know michael and i both you know um are, you know are, are in that uh that group of doctors and and there's been a lot of chat um in you know um in the cannabinoid space about how we best educate specialists um and setting up training programs and so on and so forth the the, un the postgraduate training programs that all specialists go through are incredibly dense and to find space either in a postgraduate training program or in a pre-graduate training program like medical school for example it is, is very hard you know for example statins are prescribed you know to a huge proportion of the population but statins have, take a tiny, they, they can only find space for a tiny amount of time in the, in the pre-graduate pre uh, training programs in the UK. 
uh, which is testament to the fact that the, the you know doctors have to learn an awful lot med more medicine now than, than they used to. Um, and so the, I think the best way to, to educate, so specialists want to know about data. They want to know about new things in their field and where it's evolving and where's care, where care's going. And there are early adopters and there are late adopters, but nevertheless, I think all specialists are looking for, um, for what's new. And the best way to educate clinicians is just to present the data. Um, and that is to generate the right data. I don't think that any particular training program aimed at specialists in any part of the country or in any, any specialist area is perhaps a good use of resource. I think just producing the data and the data, you know, the data gets published in a, in a journal, in an academic journal as, as everything else does um, and just gets disseminated. And I think by far, that's the best way to educate specialists. Specialists want to know about the data and they, you know, specialists are trained from, from the day, day one of going to medical school to look at trials and, and data and to assimilate it and decide, you know, if it's, you know, assess it on its merits. And I think just providing them with the data is enough to, to provide the education because they want to read it, you know, because specialists get asked about cannabis mm. you know, all the time. You know, I see in clinic, I get asked about it by, you know, uh, in my NHS practice, when you get patients with um, inflammatory bowel disease and patients want to talk about it, but, but I don't have the data to support, you know, prescribing in that area, if you like. But if there were, then that, that would be enough for all the specialists who've been talking about it, not just Daniel yeah. Couch, you know with an interest in cannabinoid pharmacology but you know all, all specialists want you know talk to other gastroenterologists they they're all talking about cannabis they want to know data and as soon as they have it they're hungry for a program per se is the best way to do this just generating the data um it is enough that's fantastic and just while we're on that topic i'd love to ask you about how you each got into this um this kind of side of medicine like you know what was it you know as simple as you know starting patients starting to ask you about this thing called medical cannabis or, or did you stumble across it in another way what well, uh, michael do you want to go first yeah no sure i can so so i'm <clears throat> uh, so as you alluded to in the introduction i'm uh, i'm an academic clinician at imperial college so i'm actually a surgeon by training uh, same as uh, dan i operate on complex liver and um, and pancreas cancer um, one day a week. Um, but at Imperial, we're all academics. So that means that at least 50% of my time spent doing research. And I first became interested in medical cannabis through my research interest in cancer biology. Um, looking at the interaction between CBD, which is you know is quite powerful anti-inflammatory, with some of the cytotoxics in <coughs> excuse me in pancreas cancer. And so, um, yeah, that became research interest. The research department grew, and here we are. <coughs> Fantastic. And, and, and Daniel? It looked like Michael just caught COVID. Um, and so, so like Michael, I'm, I'm also a GI surgeon. But, so Michael focused on the, on the pancreas and the liver, and I'm, uh, I focus on the colon. And a big part of my practice is um, in, in the NHS is inflammatory bowel disease. I'm not a gastroenterologist. I am a surgeon, and so I meet patients who have uh, who have inflammatory bowel disease. They're often at the end of their they've exhausted all the available medicines. And I I was about seven or eight years ago. I was pretty frustrated about the medicines that were available to treat inflammatory bowel disease. Quite toxic. They often they don't they have a limited efficacy. There are lots of side effects, and so I wanted to uh, kind of explore. Uh, what other medicines were out there or what other therapies we could explore and I started a, a period of research at Nottingham um, examining the role of cannabinoids and how they could be a benefit in the gut and specifically in ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease and uh, it was after me research and a few trials um, that uh, that's how my, my interest started um, and that, that, that's where that's where we are. It's fascinating just to hear the various you know, speaking at these kind of events and organizing these kind of, you know, online conferences, we meet so many people from various different pockets of the world, from so many different disciplines and backgrounds and, and just everyone's story. There's no two stories the same. And it's just always fascinating to ask people how they got into, um, into this kind of area. Um, so I have another, another question for you, just in, in terms of those, those people watching who are potential ca cannabis patients, maybe people who are curious about it, who haven't yet got in touch with the likes of Sapphire, with the likes of, of, of someone of, um, of, of your kind of 
knowledge. Um, you know, taking something like medical cannabis, how does it compare to the effects that other um, you know, prescription medicines might have on someone's day-to-day -day life? Can you go to work? Can you function as normal? You know, there's, there's often this misconception, I suppose, that, that if you're going to take something like a medical cannabis oil, that it's, it's the same as taking illicit cannabis off the street. So tell us a little bit about, you know, how it can affect um, a, a patient's day-to-day, -day if you can, if you can, whoever wants to go first. Sam, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. So um, to, to, in short, Rasheen, there's limited data uh, as, to, as to actually how this affects people's life day to day. And that's where um, kind of the, the, the live collection of data for a patient reported the data is really important because a lot of the trials that have been done so far look at very doctory endpoints. And so looking at inflammation or pain or, but not, not so much. affects your ability to work and certainly the, whether you can drive by right, taking some medicines and how it affects your ability to drive. And so certainly these things are important and I think will, will, will be elucidated through I think the collection of registry data, real world data rather than randomized controlled trial data in the next couple of years. Um, because the, the bottom line is like we, we, you know, we all know what the effects of cannabis are recreationally day to day, your sleep and so forth, anxiety. But actually, how a, med a specific medical cannabis product affects your ability to go to work, to get up, to look after your family, um, to exercise, uh, we're still in the dark about that. And we, we have an inkling because you know, our patients tell us. Um, but actually, doing uh, collecting the data in a, in a kind of an academic way to present it in a very open and clear fashion, I think, is, is still in the future. Yeah, um, absolutely. So, I mean, it's a, it's an interesting question. It's one that uh, you know, I think in the clinic we get asked a lot, um, and. There, there are a couple of different um, aspects to answering this. The first is to, to clearly do, draw the differentiation between recreational cannabis and medical cannabis. And so there, there are clear differences in terms of, you know, how, how medical cannabis is manufactured in terms of GMP and impurities and pesticides and so on. But really <clears throat> the fundamental difference when it comes to, the, um, to this question is that the, the levels of THC that's prescribed in medical cannabis is often an order lower than those seen in synthetic cannabinoids or in these high potency uh, illicit cannabis strains. So we don't, and, and, and hand in hand with that goes the fact that we don't treat patients with doses where they feel high or, or not able to function because of a high. And so, it, there's a there's a big there's a there's a big difference uh, the distinction to make there. The what what we can say is that you know we just had done an initial analysis of the UK Medical Cannabis Registry where we looked at something like um, 640 initial patients, and 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 what I can say is that for those patients uh, who were the the first cohort of patients to be prescribed. Um, medical cannabis in the UK, the adverse event rate is very low. It's in the region of, of 20 to 24%. Um, and bear in mind, if you give somebody placebo or water in a clinical trial, you're gonna get a 20% adverse event rate as well. So it's very low. If you compare it to, and, 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 the, and, and the, the rate of serious adverse events is almost non-existent. <clears throat> and so, in, in, you know, when you're asking this question, um, it's it's often important to, you know, understand the context. So now we're just talking about meds that contain THC. So for a chronic pain patient, you know, yes, medical cannabis is a medicine. It does have a side effect profile, adverse event profile. But when you compare that adverse event profile to the alternative you may be prescribed, you're probably going to find that it's um, it, it's it's favorable in comparison. Uh, if you compare it to, for instance, opioids. Um, the other obvious thing to say uh, uh, with regards to this topic is that medical cannabis is an umbrella term, which I think for the purposes of um, clinical um, research, we should try to get rid of as soon as possible uh, because you're, you're insinuating that the pure CBD oil uh, that we use to treat 
children with epilepsy is the same medicine as the 22% THC flower that we treat, uh, you know, uh, a middle-aged female with fibromyalgia and chronic pain. They're completely different chemicals that we're giving them, but we're still calling them medical cannabis. Uh, and so because they're completely different chemical profiles, they're going to have completely different side effect profiles. You know, for instance, a pure CBD oil so I think that's just an important to make, of course. And, and I think that's quite interesting from, from the point of view of what you were saying about, like, you know, from children with epilepsy to adults with fibromyalgia. There, there's so many different kind of conditions that, that we're now seeing, um, you know, in reference to, to medical cannabis. Um, I just wanted to ask you very quickly, um, is there kind of one condition that's very popular among, among people who you're seeing coming to Safar, to the clinic? Is it chronic pain? Uh, is it, you know, if you could just tell us a little yeah. bit about that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, the, about 60, 65% of patients that seek treatment of medical cannabis are chronic pain patients. Now there's a, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry about coughing earlier on as well. There's a word about COVID now. Um, but there's, there's, a, there's obviously a range of different um, reasons why they may be experiencing chronic pains, uh, but 65% are chronic pain patients. We've done some analysis looking at what our average patient looks like. Um, and that average patient at the moment is a 50 year old female who's got a chronic pain condition such as fibromyalgia, um, where, which leads to this cycle of functional disability, chronic pain, uh, um, often, often has implications on sleep quality and, and all of the things that you would expect with a chronic illness. Um, that's, our, that's our average patient at the clinic. It's fascinating because that actually ties into our um, analytics that we have from people who subscribe and, and purchase our magazine online through the various different digital platforms that we have. Our, as it currently stands today, our kind of most common um, kind of demographic for our readership is 51 year old females. So that's quite interesting how it ties into something that's totally different in a totally different kind of capacity of medical cannabis, a, a clinical setting, um, that someone could be, you know, reading a magazine about it in some way. And, and that's still the same kind of person who's going to the clinic and, and actually seeking prescriptions. That's really interesting. I just want to come to one particular question that I saw come in from um, someone who just put a question to us in the Q&A box. And thank you for the questions that are coming in. We'll try and answer as many as we can in the next kind of uh, five to 10 minutes or so. Um, this person says, I think I could be eligible for a medical cannabis prescription. How would you recommend I get one? And it, it also ties to a similar question about if you want to know more about medical cannabis, you know, where can you go to find out more? Yeah, <clears throat> so, um... So there are a number of different educational tools now for medical cannabis. I mean, we've set up Sapphire Institute for Medical Cannabis Education. That's completely a free educational resource. You can log on to that. That's gonna have both patient and healthcare professional resources uh, where you, a mixture of different types of formats. Um, so that's good. Um, the NHS has a small section on the NHS website. Um, there are a number of um, uh, um, advocacy um, pages online such as plea that have some you know uh, helpful information for patients so there are a number of different sources there is I think there is something to be said for um, for uh, being able to um, combine um, what's available into a library so that there's a, there's something easier for for the public to uh, to search um, <clears throat> that's uh, that's for the future I think if if you're interested or if you think that you may be eligible to uh, be a patient, then it's really straightforward. You just need to contact one of the clinics, register your interest. Um, the clinic will um, evaluate your medical history uh, and they'll tell you. So what we normally do is we, we look at the patient's summary of care record for Sapphire and we say, yeah, this condition um, is something that we treat. They appear to have tried this and this. It's fine, they should be uh, fine to go forward to doctor consultation. And that's all the online process it doesn't cost anything it's for an appointment um, and so that's really straightforward and and and, and there's help for um, for anyone who thinks that they're eligible uh, for treatment to go down that route 
fantastic. And as you were saying, you can go online if you think you're eligible. And I believe it's on a self-referral basis as well. So you can you can get so yeah. far and find out what you need to find out and then make your decision um, and, you know, with your consultant to see if you are actually suitable. That's that's great advice. Um, Daniel, was there a question that you wanted to answer in particular? I'm sorry, um, I broke up for a second there. You're all right. I'm just coming to you to see if there was any particular question you would like to answer from the from the Q and A box that we have on our screen. So, so I, I have seen one question about um, the assessment of research that's been done overseas, um, and this is so I, I I do I have liaised with Nice quite frequently um, in their kind of a um, sort of a data assessment team, and it's very clear that Nice. Um, and NHS England and the Department of Health want the population to get better. That's what they're there for. That's their role. Um, and it's to produce health, you know, to increase the health of the population. And they're not in the business of withholding medicines just to be nasty. Um, NICE have a very uh, meticulous ass uh, assessment process when it comes around to medicines, and that's appropriate. In question, in, the, in, in regard to um, where data's come from, it doesn't matter where data's come from, whether it's come from the UK, Germany, Israel, Mars, doesn't matter. If the research has been conducted in, a, in, a, in an open way and it's been conducted appropriately and it's got clear conclusions that can be used to assess and, and inform clinical guidance, then NICE will use it. Um, it doesn't matter where the, the, the this is, and I can, I've, I've heard this argument a few times that you know, foreign data has been ignored. NICE don't, don't care where the data is from. Um, and I don't work for NICE uh, at all. I just work, work in the NHS like any other doctor, but, um, NICE will assess evidence that's come from anywhere. Um, and they're very clear about this. We had a, a very good talk from uh, Paul, Dr. Paul Chris last week, uh, two weeks ago at our conference. And it was very clear that it doesn't matter where it's come from, Jupiter, Pluto is irrelevant. If it's good data, they all assess it. Yeah, and I think that's really important. And I attended that event as well, the Center for Medicinal Cannabis Summit, and it, it was incredibly insightful to hear from so many, um, you know, experts in this area who were, you know, really pushing to, to advance medical cannabis um, as, as well, which is really great to see. And just even the fact that we have doctors like yourselves, you know, advancing this now and, and, and you know, speaking up about it and and actually, you know, presenting the facts because that's that's what people yeah. want to see. Um, and, and I think I think that you know, and there, there is unhappiness about the speed of your appraisal process, uh, which is understandable, understandable. Um, but you know, nice, keen to get it right first time, and um, I think it's much better off they are de de deliberating on their on their judgment of medicines and the available evidence rather than giving up one guidance, finding it's wrong, reversing it, starting again. Patients coming to harm or getting the wrong medicines, and you know, start to, you know. And so I, I think that I think uh, I would say that I would be, try to be patient with nice. And they, they they want people to get better. They, if medicines work, they want to give them to patients, but they just need to be meticulous about how to do that. Of course, and I, and I think the thing that's different about medical cannabis in particular compared to other drugs and development of drugs in previous decades is we now have this platform called social media where people can go on Twitter and, and people can go on various different websites and, and you know, yeah. There's so much of an online campaign as well. Why don't we have this yet on the NHS? Why can't we just get it overnight? Yeah. And I think that's sometimes what we forget is the data is key, isn't it? Um, yeah, and also, I mean, in the case of medicinal cannabis, the, the patients are essentially about 500 years ahead of the doctors. It's been used colloquially more so the last 100 years to, to, to treat, you know, to, to relieve symptoms. And, um, and I think that because the patients are ahead of the doctors, we're on the, you know, the medical assessment process on the back foot and that's why it's taking time. If, okay. if it wasn't already in the, in the population, we, this wouldn't even be a conference question. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you both for your time. We do have some other questions that have come in which are of a, a medical nature, such as, um, you know, taking medical cannabis while you're taking other medication. And I suppose that's a very specific question for anyone to answer at a conference. So we will let um, anyone who would like some information on, on those very specific kind of questions of a medical nature, we'd love to um, put you forward to go onto the website for Sapphire Medical in particular to, you know, put yourself forward for, um, you know, a consultation, see if you're eligible and, and a doctor there can help you and answer whatever questions you might have. Um, would either of you like to say anything before we finish? Um, Michael, would you like to, to give the web address? And Daniel, would you like to, to mention anything about the Centre for Medicinal Cannabis just before we finish up? 
And so, uh, well, um, so <laughs> Central Medicine of Cannabis, so, so we've been working now for about three years um, and our, our key role really is to get the right medicines for the right patients. Um, or we are funded by um, industry members and they fund the work that we do. Um, but the work that we do is to bring appropriate medicines to the right patients. Um, and, uh, and, and that's, that's, what, that's what we're there for. And, that, and that's our, our kind of mission, or well, my mission essentially. Yeah, thanks. I, I mean, I'd just like to finish off by thank you again for organizing this. I think, it's, I think it's, this is actually one of the best ways of being able to <clears throat> raise awareness and for more, more patients to be able to access the medicines through education, through forums like this through interaction with the medical profession, asking questions, understanding where we are in research and so on. So uh, congratulations on this event and thanks for the invite. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you for giving up your time, like I said. And, and I, I do hope that cough, you know, has passed. <laughs> but yeah, okay just about, just about. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, listen, thank you very much. It was great to speak to you as always. And um, I'm, sure, I'm sure our paths will cross again in the, in the very near future. Um, in fact, myself and Daniel are on a panel for another conference in a couple of weeks time. So um, I will see you there at that event. But thank you very much for your time. And we really appreciate it and have a great afternoon. Grand. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you.